Night flying is a great challenge and great fun, but at times extremely challenging, especially in areas remote with no ambient lighting. This can leave pilots vulnerable to various illusions which can cause havoc in the mind. In this episode, we're going to look at the various visual illusions and human factors affecting pilots at night. All that and more coming right up. So strap in and let's get into it. G'day everyone and welcome to episode 133 of the Flight Training Australia podcast. No matter where you are in Australia or the world, ferrying an aeroplane, teaching somebody, transporting passengers or picking up freight, this is the episode all about flying and flight training in Australia and beyond. G'day, I'm your host Trent Robinson. Again, thank you for joining me for another great episode. 200,000 downloads, people. Actually, it's more than that now. Um, But when I had a look the other day, we've hit a real milestone, over 200,000 downloads. Unbelievable. Uh, Coming up two and a half years now, the podcast has been running, going strength to strength. Number one podcast in Australia for aviation, Uh, all aviation topics, not just flight training, just blows my mind. So to everybody who listens, again, thank you so much for your support. It uh, really, really just humbles me and and means the absolute world. A big shout out to all my Patreon members uh, with a few of you coming on board just this week and uh, and last week. So thank you for your support. It means the world again. If you aren't aware, Patreon is a free subscription service, a free subscription service rather, where I can share things exclusively, a bit of a blog post and that sort of thing. But there are also three financial support options which are available to listeners. So you can make a one-off donation or you can uh, come online, three tiers of support. And the top tier, you get an exclusive Flight Training Australia coffee mug and uh, you get to enjoy your favourite hot beverage as you listen to your favourite Flight Training Australia podcast. There's also discounted annual subscriptions as well. And uh, not only that, but all subscriptions, people, are tax deductible. Yep, we're coming up to the end of the financial year. So what greater gift to yourself and to me than uh, coming on board as a patron subscriber? It's the price of a coffee a month starts at that bit more. Ask you the information you get through this podcast. What is it worth to you for briefing charges and everything else you'd have to pay? It's an absolute bargain. So jump on board. I would love to have you there. Patreon.com forward slash Flight Training Australia or click the link in the episode description of the podcast player you are listening to right now. Speaking of supporting future projects, I'm going to be off to Brisbane this week uh, to join the team at Strike Aviation for the UPRT conference with Rich Stoll on Friday. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic day talking about all sorts of things, uh, emergency manoeuvre training, UPRT training, uh, stalls, spins, human factors, spatial awareness, a whole heap of fantastic topics are going to be discussed on the day. We're joined by uh, RA Oz coming in as well. So it's GA, RA Oz, really great uh, area. We're going to have CASA getting involved as well and definitely well worth coming. So if you are a partner looking to get some extra training and uh, exposure to various things, I couldn't recommend anything else really, than doing that on the Friday. It's going to be a great day. I will be there, so I'd love to meet you all. And if you are lucky enough, I think there's only like one, maybe two spots left. I haven't checked. Um, but there's a chance to fly Rich Stoll on the weekend. Saturday is full. Sunday, I'm pretty sure there's one or two left at the time of my voice going into this microphone. So get in quick. Uh, that would be a fantastic opportunity to fly with the man himself and pick up some fantastic skills just to further improve your flying standards. Following that on the Monday, the July 1st and Tuesday, the 2nd, uh, the Create Better Pilots Open Forum. If you're an employer, a trainer, an examiner, you need to be part of this. We've got uh, members coming from Virgin Australia, Sharp Airlines. Uh, I've got guest speakers coming from 
uh, all walks of aviation. We've got Angela Garvey from Navigating Australia. We've got uh, Maddie Johnson from Aftia. We've got myself, Paul Strike, uh, Casa uh, presenting. We've got Mark Greenfield from the UK uh, talking about the U- UPRT uh, training implementation and how they've gone about it in the UK and some things they did wrong and hopefully we can avoid doing here. Casa will be presenting on their proposal, which is coming out later in the year. And there's going to be some fantastic workshops all about the system of flight training delivery, the uh, syllabus, the delivery itself, the assessment process, some human factors issues, scenario-based training. It's going to be some really great workshops and uh, skills and ideas to take back to relative flying organizations and really for us to as well grab more data and intel on what's going on out there as well. So. If you can still make it, uh, 100% recommend it'll be well worth your time. It's a fantastic professional development process. If you've got someone coming up who's going to be a head of a flying operations soon, head of operations, working towards a flight examiner or a senior member of your check and training team for part 119 that's coming up, it'll be a fantastic opportunity to really find out what's going on in industry and a bit of catch up. So it's open to instructors, it's open to anyone in the flight training and first job airline delivery market, uprtconference.com, follow the link to the industry forum, create better pilots, this is the whole goal and we would love to have you there. If you can't make it there, we do understand time is precious and uh, it's not as available to us all as we'd like. There is a live streaming session as well, which you can participate in. It will be a limited interaction. We're going to make it as interactive as we can. Uh, we're just working on getting all that set up. This stuff does cost money, so we're trying to do it as economically as possible so prices can be kept low. And again, you pay twice as much for a day seminar for something that uh, we're putting on and we just want as many people there as possible. So jump on the link, upotconference.com, grab your tickets, get on a plane, book a hotel, Come and have some fun. Come and network. Come and meet uh, others in the field, swap stories, all the good stuff that comes from events like this. Uh, This is an industry-led, industry-run conference. So please get out there and support it. And I will look forward to your company and meeting you all there. All right. So the other thing I'll be doing is uh, heading off to Brisbane Centre and one of the, talking about projects, I've been wanting to get to Brisbane Centre for a long time to do some filming and some uh, videos and stuff on just what goes on there. Uh, if you use Melbourne Centre, it doesn't matter. It's going to be exactly the same thing, just you change the name. But uh, really looking forward to doing that. So I'm talking to the team there. They're really excited about me coming up to do that and I'll uh, have some more information on it. As such, there won't be an episode next week. I'm probably just not going to have the time, but I will be back and uh, there'll be plenty of stuff going on online. So if you're not already following me on Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn, make sure you do that and uh, check out the story and uh, posts, all that sort of thing. You know how it works by now. All right. So doing some night flying lately and both times with pilots who have flown at night before, but it has been some substantial time between sessions and they soon realized how uncurrent they were, uh, not saying that they thought they were, but yeah, just really going, wow, you know, they were surprised at uh, how much uh, they'd forgotten and, 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 and how long it took to readapt and, and really showing how important currency at night is. So they, uh, yeah, we're also coming to some various illusions, two different nights, two different scenarios. One was a moonless night and up here in the Territory and as it is with many remote areas, it is just black. There's nothing. Darwin doesn't put off that much light at night, um, ambient light, so it doesn't take long, especially with your back to it, that it's just dark. And we were having issues just on crosswind and climb out with no visual horizon uh, this was IFR flying, so again, IFR syllabus has some night component, but usually very minimal, and it had been a long time. So it took a little while just to settle in and get the, the ears and the eyes and the head and everything all geared in and get the scan going to to fight these feelings. 
The other one was an I-5 flight as well, but at night uh, in very smoky conditions with a crescent moon. And again, just making life very difficult and uh, working very, very hard. So I thought, I haven't really talked about this before. Um, I've touched on it, but yeah, haven't really spoken about the human factors elements. These are at night, uh, can also be obviously in cloud and in IMC conditions, but I thought I'll speak specifically about the flights uh, over the last couple of weeks and some of the issues that we were coming up against. And I have to say for myself as well, um, especially about the first topic I'm going to talk about, black hole effect is probably one of the best examples slash worst if you're the one trying to fly. Um, but yeah, one of the best examples of black hole effect that I'd seen. So let's have a think about it. So we are discussing visual illusions. All right? These are visual illusions, vestibular illusions, meaning as a result from sensations from the inner ear. And these can cause these things. So some are visual ones, some are sensory illusions. So due to the natural lack of light, obviously, it does significantly reduce our visual cues. Now we know this from driving a car, walking around the house in the dark, all that sort of thing. Uh, but these are essential for spatial orientation. So without these cues, our senses can be easily fooled, leading, leading to dangerous illusions. Now, if you don't know much about it, I'm sure you've all had a bit of vertigo or been on the couch at some point, got up too quick and lost a bit of orientation, got a bit dizzy. Now, in a nice general sense, that's all happening because your eyes are sensing movement. It sends a signal to your brain and the brain sees what the, the eyes are telling it, go, hey, we're moving. And the brain goes, ears, can you confirm? Now, if you look at the middle ear, we've got three uh, semicircular canals, and they're essentially orientated in the pitch roll in your planes. And there's fluid that moves in the air, little stones, and this sends forces back to the brain to show that it's accelerating, decelerating, leaning, forward tilting, all that sort of thing, and correlates that information with the visual sense from your eyes. Now, if the brain can't do that, this is where the disorientation and confusion comes in, and you get a little bit giddy and wall until you pick up more cues to help sort of orientate where you are and figure things out. And this is exactly what happens at night. We don't have much of a horizon, if any at all. And so our typical up and down, bright and dark from the sky and the ground, is no longer there. And if you haven't flown at night in a particularly dark scenario, it especially on a still calm night, it is a surreal feeling. It was almost like we're just just floating and everything outside is moving around us. It's it's a really bizarre feeling sometimes and can be very disorientating. So I mentioned black hole effect. What's that all about? Well, it happens at night during an approach and it can be over water or unlit terrain all right, where, again, there is an absence of a visual horizon and ground light features are not visible or available. Now, this could happen where an airstrip is just orientated off to the side of a town, but the lights are not featuring enough to affect the local circuit area. So pilots can feel like they're higher than they are because there's no visual references, and this often results in a potentially very dangerously low approach. So essentially without a clear horizon or ground lighting, the runway seems to just float. And this is what we're getting the other night you would have seen in my story, I posted a photo and I'll put it on the main channel and some stuff on uh, Patreon as well, where the runway, it's like there's a bunch of lights connected to Perspex and they're on fishing line and someone is just sort of dancing it around outside the window. Kid you not, this is what it was like the other night. And like I said, because of the smoke, it just made it um, really surreal. So because of this, the runway looks like it's floating. You can't see the ground before it, around it. There's just this big black void and can really confuse the pilot's perception of altitude and distance. Now, who out there has flown a uh, Garmin equipped or some sort of uh, terrain awareness where you might get a call out like this? 500. All right. Most people just ignore it. All right. But that is there 
pretty much not solely, but for a big reason, because of black hole effect. It is ideally set up that you want to roll wings level and be established on final prior to 500 AGL. And the call out of 500 feet is there to ensure that you are not falling victim to the black hole effect and are lower than you think you are. So all through night training since I've ever done it and any flying IFR or night VFR, I've always made my students call 500 foot established on final. And this is precisely why. Now we've got G1000s, Gamma 500s and all the variations uh, that usually have this call out and I make them acknowledge that instead um, so that they are conscious that they are above 500 feet when it happens. If it calls it out and they're still manoeuvring or in the turn, then we need to really look at what we're doing. All right, so that's black hole effect. Moving on, we've got somatographic effect. Now, this one uh, is also called the false climb. And the way I get students to remember this one is climbing, going against gravity, somatographic, okay, gravity. And this one is very much uh, a mixture of a visual illusion, but also a sensory illusion, sensory illusion. This occurs due to the brain misinterpreting acceleration as a change in pitch. So the fluid in the ears as we go and accelerate because of the lack of visual cues makes the brain think we're pitching up. Of course, then when we come to rotate and take off, we do actually pitch up and we pitch up into a horizonless, unlit sky. And so there's nothing to, to really work at what's going on. The hairs and the fluid move back even further, making the brain think it's you've over-rotated and you, you're, you're pointing 20, 30 degrees up into the air. So you then pitch forward to try and prevent that. This, of course, introduces further acceleration effects on the air. You push forward more until eventually the aircraft crashes uh, some, you know, two, three miles, five miles upwind from the runway. It's an absolute disaster. I have uh, lost a former student to this effect and I don't want to lose anybody else. It's uh, the false climb. It's called that for a reason because of these sensory illusions. So this is the precise reason why when you take off at night, we actually do the one thing you pretty much get told never do, and that is bring your eyes into the cockpit and onto the instruments. Establish a positive rate of climb on the vertical speed indicator, set a pitch attitude on the attitude indicator, and a stable climb speed on the airspeed indicator. All right. it's uh, This is why this has to be done, and also minimizing head movement, because this is, this is something we'll talk about in the next effect, which is somatogyral effect, or the leans. The instrument flying is really, really important. Now, if you've trained at an aerodrome that has lots of ambient lighting, like pretty much every major Class D airport in Australia, you can tend to be a bit sloppy about this and take off and look outside because you can make out city lights, suburban lights, and a horizon. But this is a skill set that is absolutely crucial. So you need to be practicing and doing it properly which is flying off the instruments for your upwind leg, your crosswind turn. Uh, the only real visual turn is when you're turning on to final because we've got a runway to orientate off of, all right? But that's a whole night circuits briefing, and we'll talk about that another time. So the leans or somatogyral, gyro, rolling around, exactly as it sounds. And the leans, I remember I experienced the leans the first time when I did my first IFR flight after my training. I had very limited cloud during the time when I did my instrument rating. And one of my first charters, I was doing a SID out of Janicot and I got a vector to the southwest and I started my turn and at the same time I went into cloud and I just started tumbling. I fought it, I followed my instruments, I did as I was trained and I soon, soon overcame it. But it's a really uncomfortable feeling. And we use the word when we talk about somatographic and somatogyral as insidious, 
meaning it creeps up on you. You can you can be unaware. Uh, a lot of students, when they're flying the simulator, one of the biggest complaints they have, it's not realistic, it's not real, and they keep rolling off and falling out. Okay, well, actually, I know it doesn't necessarily feel like an aeroplane, but the simulator is there designed to develop your scan rate because when you come in the aeroplane, they still fall off the altitude perch, they roll, they start descending because they've put their head down and looking at maps and charts, flight plans, whatever else, and then they suddenly look up and they cannot believe it. So trust me, take it from me, listen to your instructors. It happens quickly and it can happen without your knowledge. Now, you might just see that as only lost 100 feet or a couple hundred feet or change 20 degrees of heading or whatever else, all right? But imagine if you're really distracted. I've had people that have had their head down for a fair, decent time frame, and it was quite a while before they actually realized that uh, they effectively had lost control of the airplane, albeit briefly. So the leans, just to clarify, is an incorrect sense of angle of bank. Um, it can happen during a quick roll, it can happen over a smooth roll, but it's usually a bit more of a, a jerky response or a jerky action. Again, the fluid in the semicircular canals can create a sensation of banking in the opposite direction, causing the pilot to lean into the perceived but incorrect bank. This can then particularly be dangerous, of course, at night or in IMC because we cannot see anything else outside to confirm what we're feeling. Um, one of the ways I recreate this uh, illusion or sensory illusion is to get the pilot to enter a rate one turn and then I have them close their eyes. And we just continue the turn as best they can with their eyes closed. And what this does is normalizes the bank angle, it kind of resets the brain into a new horizon. I'll then, with their eyes closed, ask them to roll to what they feel is wings level and try and keep it there. And usually what happens is they roll right, they feel like they've overbanked and overrolled, and then they correct it and come back left and usually go straight back into uh, a spiral dive in the direction they're originally going. Some people ask a little bit longer, but very rarely manage to keep it straight. There's usually a bit of up and down and rolling and eventually they'll lose it. And I'm sure you've all seen the 178 seconds video um, that the FAA did and CASA reproduced, which is the average time it took for pilots to lose orientation completely and spiral into the ground. Definitely not something you want. And this is, again, why we go into unusual attitude recoveries, both full and limited panel skills that you really want to uh, be able to do. All right. So black hole effect, somatographic and somatogyral, probably the main uh, effects that are going to get you at night, um, also in cloud, of course, but we're talking about night. A couple of other ones, another one to be aware of is autokinesis. All right, so this can happen when a pilot stares at a single light source against a dark background for a long period and the light starts to jump around and move erratically, which can cause disorientation and uh, potentially then lead to incorrect response in incorrect control inputs. So the key to this one is avoid fixating on single points and scanning your environment. You want to be looking at things close, looking at things far to the left, to the right, but also to help with those other effects, you don't want to minimize erratic head movement at night. It's more moving the eyes around than the head. Um, obviously, we need to turn and look onto crosswind and potentially back at the runway, but we just want to do it nice and smoothly. This is also why we do rate one turns and nice, smooth control inputs. We don't want to just jerk response and snap it back if we notice we've dropped a wing or anything else because this can lead to inducing the tumbling effect and, and all these other things I've, I've mentioned. Um, vertigo, you can definitely get vertigo. Not so much a big deal, but it happens. Again, sensation of spinning or dizziness, usually, again, because of the lack of visual horizons at night, can be triggered by a variety of factors, but it's not what you might think. Usually it's coming about things like fatigue. Uh, we have reduced oxygen at night because of the collapsing of the ionosphere. We are tired, especially if we've been doing a long day's work. All these things can enhance, um, well, enhance the risk, change our visual perception. 
And this is where being well rested and being aware of our body naturally starting to shut down and and uh, rest at night when we trying to get it to perform at the same peak fit, fitness level and uh, cognitive function for our brain as we would during the daytime. So be aware of that. We can obviously do things like getting well rested, being mindful of our night vision as well. Our eyes can take up to 30 minutes to adjust. So make sure we know how to vary the intensity of our lighting, change uh, that gradually winding it down as we go so we can see more and more outside. If you can't see the stars, turn those lights down. Know how to go into the auxiliary settings of your GPSs and your, your screens. Sometimes the automatic dimming isn't enough and you need to get in there and, and do it manually. All these things uh, can help contribute to staying in control and having a wonderful and pleasant night flying experience. All right, guys, if you've uh, you know fallen victim to some of these uh, sensations and illusions, I'd love to hear about it. You know where to get me. Flick me an email, info at trentrobinsonaviation.com.au. You can hit me on any of the social media forums as well. And I very much look forward to talking to you all in about two weeks' time. So make sure that you uh, jump on board the online streaming sessions for the seminars on the open workshop. So I got that back to front, didn't I? The workshop and the open seminar, the open conference there. We'd love to have your input. And I will also, uh, yeah, look forward to meeting a bunch of you over there. We'll, uh, might even be able to put on a bit of a top end flying seminar or something on the weekend. I'm not sure. I haven't uh, looked into that at the moment yet, but we might be able to do something. If that's something you'd like to uh, attend, let me know and then I'll, I'll try and uh, make something happen. All right, everybody. Until then, blue skies and remember the golden rule aviate, navigate, communicate. See ya.